Hello everyone. Today we have Malcolm from Manitoba and he's going to tell us how he got saved and became a Christian. So let's welcome Malcolm on Zoom and talk to him today. Hello Malcolm, how are you today? Good morning Andy. I am very well, thank you. Thank you Malcolm for coming on Zoom and being able to share your testimony with us today. Without further ado, please tell us how you got saved. Thank you for the opportunity. And I am talking to you from a small city in Canada right now, uh, Manitoba, uh, where we live, but that's not where my story starts. I was uh, born in England, uh, in the city of Birmingham in 1933. You probably think that's all, it's not even on the calendar, but it is. And I was born there into a, uh, a family. Uh, I was the eldest son, so I was the first born. Uh, my father uh, and mother, uh, were, li uh, were living there and had both been born in that same city. Uh, my father was in the British Navy, Royal Navy, as a chief petty officer. And so we didn't see him very much uh, because they would often be away for long periods of time. Uh, but anyway, my, uh, my, we had a good home there. And uh, uh, eventually I had another two brothers uh, born into the family. So I was the eldest of three. Uh, one of the things that uh, really uh, made us important in our life, or oh, I would say that we moved out of Birmingham because the war was on, mm. the war started, and we moved to a more rural place. But we were very, uh, very much taken up, my family was, with the local church there, uh, which, of course, had the steeple and the bell and the rest of it. It was all over England like that. And we were very, very regular members there, right from my earliest days. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed all the, the things at the, at the church, and, and it, was, uh, it was a blessing. And when I was old enough, I joined the choir there and became part of the church, along with my mother. My father was, of course, still away in, in the military, and, uh, and I enjoyed it. And uh, I was a singer, and still am a singer, and uh, we, we enjoyed that. And then a little bit older, I was invited to be uh, also a server, and that was a man who served the priest and helped him. And I would light the candles, and of course we had all the paraphernalia on, a cassock and black cassock and white surplus, and I really felt very, very holy. In fact, I often say if I felt sometimes if I just had wings, I'd probably been an angel. <laughs> but that was just the outward. Uh, I was not uh, always a good boy inwardly but just in boyish things. Now, I'm very thankful that I never got into any of the real major things that many of the other boys at school did because, well, I liked to be right with the priest and with the church. But my best friend there was, was a young man named Peter. And uh, Peter and I, we were, I was the head choir boy on one side of the church and he was the head choir boy on the other and we were both the same age and we did everything together good things, naughty things, and uh, also the church things. And uh, everything was really quite normal. Uh, we were then, and I, my story really gets to about uh, the 14 or 15 years old. I'm not sure when we really uh, started to uh, develop in, in other things, but I do find that around about that age is when people do start to think sometimes more a little bit about God as they mature into those teen years. And, but anyway, um, I would just mention that I had been very, very ill. And, and I was 10 days on the danger list with a, um, a burst appendix when I was about nine or 10. And uh, the doctor said that w they were too late and that I wasn't going to live. Well, I did. And, uh, and obviously, uh, but it did put me back in many ways, six months without school. I was off school for six months and that affected my education even though I was very thankful that I did go to a grammar school, a very good grammar school, which of course in England is, is, is fine to go to a grammar school, but I didn't enjoy uh, school because I was always that far behind and I was a tall boy, but, uh, and everyone else was so much smaller, you know, in the class. I do remember that I was just coming, I was just recovering from uh, that sickness when VE day was, was uh, brought about and I saw, all these celebrations and everything from my house, but I was still not uh, there. So, so that's a long time ago. And so then we jumped forward a few years to, to uh, being about 14. And, uh, uh, 
and then Peter said something to me one day. We we didn't we used to do stuff on Saturday and uh, when we weren't in school and that. But he said to me, "What do you do after church on Sunday night?" I said, "Well, I go home. What else? There's nothing else to do." Well, he said, um, uh, "I'm going. I go to a youth hour." And uh, I said, "What is a youth hour?" <laughs> he said, "Well, he said it's a fun time for youth." But uh, there's, so somebody comes and talks and reads a verse from the Bible and talks. But he said, we don't need to bother with that. I said, well, why would I, why would I go? Why do you go? Well, he said, there's really only two reasons that I go. Uh, the one is that the lunch is very good that they give. The lunch is very good. And the other thing is that the girls are very pretty. <laughs> and so I said, well, I'll be there with you next week. And uh, that was all I needed to, to go there. And he was right. They're very nice people in this little place that I thought, this is not a church. <laughs> it was kind of converted a Nissan hut, or they call them a Quonset over here, I guess. And, and, but it was nice. But there was no altar in there. There were no candles there. And so that was, to me, that was church, you see, which I was still part of. Uh, but anyway, we, we started going there. And uh, the, a man would come, and he must have spoken at another meeting, I guess, before, and he would speak to the youth. and. Uh, we never really listened. We were more interested in teasing the girls or when's the lunch coming, you know? But anyway, one day, and I can't remember the day, I never do, I, uh, I listened and I heard something. And we had a, a man there, Arid man had befriended us. His name was Mr. Lord, L-O-R-D. And uh, I went to him afterwards and I said, Mr. Lord, I said, this man was talking something about sinners. I said, now, I'm, I'm not a sinner, am I? And he said very wisely, he said, Malcolm, it doesn't matter what I think you are. <laughs> it matters what God says you are. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so thankful. I'm just going to show you this for a minute. Uh, this is a, a, a Bible that came from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And my father brought me one. And it's got the wooden, wooden covers on it and the rest of it, olive wood. And I knew that this was the word of God. Never read it, but I was, and you know, just as we get to this point, that's somewhere where you have to start. If a person does not even believe that the Bible is the truth, then all we have to show people and tell them is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And he opened it to me, to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And he said, here, read this, Malcolm. And I read it. For all have sinned and come short, fallen short of heaven, of the grace of God. I said to him, all who? All who? Uh, certainly, I mean, I go to church. I'm religious. It, 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 not, it, it can't be just everybody. Mm. And he said, no, Malcolm, it's all of mankind. It's every soul that's ever been born because they were the children of, from Adam. And Adam said, well, I, I, I often use this expression. It was as though I'd been hit on the head with a, with a mallet. It so affected me. And I said, what? And I left, left there and went home. And I'm not sure of the length of time, but I am a person that doesn't waste much time when it comes to something as important. <laughs> and as I lay in my bed there and I, several nights and in the dark and thinking, you mean I'm not ready for heaven? If I'd have died back there, <laughs> maybe I wouldn't have gone to heaven. Now, having said that, I'd never heard the gospel, so I'd never rejected it. But then it hit me that maybe that I wasn't ready for heaven. And so one night I could take it no longer. I said, I have to get this settled. So I got out of my bed and, and I think, I, I think I'm right in saying, for the first time ever, I knelt by my bed. We weren't taught to pray at home. You go to church to pray. <laughs> you don't read your Bible at home. You yeah. get the Bible at church. Anyway, things are going to change a little bit. And so I got by my, by my bed and, and I thought, oh dear, now what do I say? Well, I remembered a verse that I didn't realize it was a verse, but I remembered it was something that we sang as choruses at this youth hour. And you, you, you should go in to your Bible. If you haven't got one, uh, we can always get you a Bible uh, and read it. It's in the Gospel of John. And if you open up into the New Testament, you'll see it there, John and chapter three, and it's a good chapter to read, 
But when you get down to verse 16, that is the verse that I meant. And it said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. That means and go to hell, but have everlasting life. So I said, Lord, I know that's a verse from the Bible. And if that's right, then I have sinned. And I know that I've thought wrong thoughts. I've argued with my father. I've done all sorts of things. So that means I am a sinner. But Jesus died for sinners, so he died for me. <laughs> and I simply said right by my bed there, then, Father, I accept what Jesus did as enough to cleanse me from my sin. And the blood that he shed there would cleanse me from my sin. And, you know, I just got up from my bed and I thought, well, that's something. And I put the light on and I looked for a pencil and paper, but I couldn't find one, but I found a pencil. Mm -hmm. So I went over to the wall on my wallpaper in my bedroom. Now, don't do this. You know, I was told don't write on the wall, but I did this night. I wrote on the wall and I put saved and I put the date down on the wall. And, you know, a lot of things happened after that, but I have never in all these years, if you can work it out now, I'm 86, coming up 87 uh, years. And of course, it was a little less than that when I got saved. Take 15 away from that. You'll find out when, when it was. I am sure that not only was my name written on that wall, which of course had gone long ago because we moved from the house, but it was written in heaven mm -hmm. because that's what the Bible says. Your name can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who you are or anybody who can ever think they can take it out of there. <laughs> And so I've had that confidence all my life. And I'm so thankful that I have because I know many people are not so sure. And they wonder whether they did what was right. And I thought, well, it wasn't me doing anything. It's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And that meant so much to me. And so I, I can't undo that because uh, I was still a member of the church. Uh, I felt I should go and just mention what had happened. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the, the pre uh, preacher, uh, who was a, a, a lovely man, what we had basically say a godly man. I told him what had happened and, and I was disappointed in what he said. He said, oh, oh, Malcolm, you don't need that. You're a good boy. And I realized, no, 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 you don't know. I was good to, in front of you, but I was not good in my heart. Mm -hmm. And very many wicked things and thoughts and everything else that were in, in, my, in, my, in my heart. So I, I made a decision before God that I was not going to support uh, that, that church any longer. And so I started going to this little uh, hut, which I found was, was called an assembly of, of Christians that meet together. And uh, I started to, to go there. Well, uh, I will say that uh, just for anybody who's interested, that when you make a decision like I made and like so many people who are Christians have made, Satan will then do his utmost <laughs> Uh, to rob you of what you've got. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways he did it with me uh, was with my family because my father was very upset that I was leaving the church of our fathers and the rest of it. And, and I, I loved him, but, but we, couldn't, we couldn't come to an agreement on this. Mm -hmm. And so I continued with, with these people and they, they taught me uh, the word of God, which I'd never had before. We'd only listened to it being read, and, but I'd never been taught it. And I had a Christian school teacher, which was, which was a, a blessing too. And uh, she was having scripture union, it was called, scripture union classes. And uh, she really kind of watched me. Well, then, okay, the devil didn't win that one. So my, my dad sells the house and we move back into Birmingham, right into this metropolis of 7 million people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, I finished up going to, uh, with my mother to a place that she had gone as a girl. And uh, the rest of it, she said, I think you'll like it. It's probably like one of these halls that you go to. Mm -hmm. Well, it was not. And that was about a year probably when I was the most miserable person I could ever be because I knew that I was not amongst people who were Christians. Yes. So, so anyway, one day my teacher, the teacher caught me. You know, I'd, I'd been kind of <laughs> avoiding her because I knew what she was going to ask. <laughs> And she said, uh, Stanley, wh where are you going now? I hear you've moved. And yes, ma'am, yeah. But I'm going with my mother down here. She said, oh, dear. I said, I don't know where there's a gospel hall, which is what they were called over there, okay? 
I said, what? There's one just around the corner from where you live within five minutes. I said, no, I'd never gone that way because it was just over there on the road. And I heard that there was one there and it was called the Slade Assembly. And that's where I, I was there the next Sunday. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't long before I saw the truth of baptism by immersion. And I was baptized and received into the fellowship, as we call it, or as a member, some people would say a member, of that assembly there. And so uh, then comes a big, uh, a big move in my life. Uh, I recognized this young lady in, in this uh, assembly named Jean, and we started to uh, court. And uh, in 1955, uh, we were married. And uh, I lived for a while there uh, in, in England, and I was dissatisfied, though, with the work situation and things that were going on in the country. So uh, we, I investigated immigration. And uh, in 1957, we emigrated from there to Canada, right to where I am now in this very place. And the reason being because there was an assembly, a church here. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to go anywhere where there was not an assembly. And we actually stayed with one of the elders here, and I worked for him. And uh, that's that's how we came here in 50, 1957, and we've been here ever since. And God has blessed us with four children and 16 grandchildren and 12 great-grandchildren. And for the most of them are still around this area. I have one son that's about two and a half, about three hours away. So that's... That's the way God worked, and a lot of things happened there. And I just want to say whether we get time to do this or not, but when you, when you do what uh, you should do when you become a Christian, and you commit your life to say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And I just want to encourage people that when God speaks, then the best thing you can do is to move in that direction because that will give you peace and give you joy and to know that God has things for you to do. And uh, I'm going to just stop right there now and we'll just, uh, just see what else you would like, like me to say. Thank you, Malcolm. I enjoyed listening to your story. Now, I really want to know what do you appreciate the most about being saved and forgiven of your sins? Thank you. Thank you. That's so good. Well, you know, there are, there are different sins that people have and are forgiven of. Some people were alcoholic people. Some people were, uh, you know, very he- heavily into drugs and this sort of thing. And, and so those people, they get saved and they can be delivered of those things. And that's okay. a, it's the greatest thing that just took up their whole life. I think that one of my problems was, was probably more, more in the mind, in the mind of thinking wrong things. And, and uh, you know, the rest of it and uh, all about different things. And, and that was really, I was never, uh, only ever stole one thing once when I was with a bunch of boys from a store and I was so afraid I took it back and put it on back in and I've never stolen anything since. So and that was not a problem. Mm-hmm. But one the wonderful thing is that when it, eventually, which you will do, be con- convicted about what it is in your life that's the problem. You go to him, you confess it, and you can leave it there and know that, that you are forgiven. But he's also forgiven you then of these sins that, that people do, you know. And, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to know that we can never lose our salvation. Mm-hmm. But you know what we can lose? We can lose our fellowship with God. And by allowing sin and not confessing it, and it might be, and, and yeah, another thing was of saying the wrong thing and of uh, saying things to people and offending them and the rest of it. And, and I just say, oh, Lord, why? Oh, please, you've got to forgive me of this again. Lord, I'm sorry. Please help me to control my, my words when I'm angry with somebody, you know. And, uh, and then to know, well, I was forgiven because when Jesus died, he died for all my sins. But now, as in First John tells us, if you confess our sins, That's the things that we do now in the the body. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, to put us back into fellowship. We all have experience, I'm sure, in our life, uh, getting out of sorts with our father or our mother. And we're waiting for them to come home, you know. And your mother says, 
you're going to meet your dad. And that's, that's not fun. That's not fun. But what is right is when you come and you face him and when the father does the right thing and uh, maybe you need to be punished in some way or denied something that you wanted. And then he says, come here, gives you a hug and says, all right, that's it. That's the type of thing we're talking about. Then you're back in fellowship. You're not worried about, oh, I've offended my father. Or I've done this or the rest of it. And that can be right spiritually as well. Mm-hmm. And so I, I have in, enjoyed that. And I, I said, I, I lived a life of confession. <laughs> confession to God, Father, I messed up on this. I said the wrong thing. But he forgives. And then he says, all right, now away you go and do it right. So I would think that that is one of the biggest blessings that a person can know. Because I know some people don't handle that very well. Mm-hmm. And they get all torn up because of the things that they still do instead of confess, confessing it and forsaking it. So. Thank you, Malcolm. Now, I wanted to ask if you have any short message for the people who are watching this video right now. Yes, yeah. Um, I often say, talk, I talk to a lot of people. I should mention that one of the things that I, I am right now, I'm a chaplain at the Winnipeg International Airport. So I meet with people there. We're allowed to talk to people, staff, and the rest of it. And a lot of people say, yes, well, yeah, well, I've got my religion, you know, and that'll be often what they come out. I've got my religion. I talk to all sorts of people. And I say, well, well, that's good. Sometimes it can be a great help to somebody. But I said, it is not religion that will take you to heaven. It's not religion that will make you right with God. I said, if you're a church church goer and the church has teaches the bible then that's good to be at that church but listen to what the bible says but it's not religion it's a relationship and that's what god wants he doesn't just want your religion that's what i had and if i'd have carried on like that i would never have been in heaven oh you say i don't believe that well you don't have to believe it it's a fact my religion would not have saved me or cleansed me from my sin mm-hmm. It needs that I then have an encounter with God and with the Lord Jesus. We do this through prayer. And that's why there are people who get saved just just as easily as I did by my bed. And they do it in church too, many people. They hear a good message in there and they bow their head while they're sitting right there. And they say, Lord Jesus, I confess my sin to you. I have sinned and I am not fit for heaven, but Jesus died for me. And you personalize it. I never heard that. I knew Jesus died. I knew all about it. We sang about it. I sang Handel's Messiah. I knew all that wonderful music, but I never personalized it until that day in my bedroom. And so that's what you need to do. And it doesn't matter what church you're in or any such thing. And if you're going to a a good Bible-believing church, then God bless you. You don't have to change to come to where I go or any such thing. God has brought me here, and I'm satisfied with it because we do teach the Bible particularly. But there are many places that do. And I have many friends that go to different churches. And we love the Lord because we have trusted him at some time in our life as our own personal savior. So that would be my advice to any of you. Don't, don't go looking around for one of my churches. just like that. Oh, I've got to find one of those because that's, no, no, no. That's not it. You can do it right where you are. If you're listening to this, to this message right now, you could just bow your head and just say, Lord Jesus, I need what Malcolm found there and what millions have found that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. So that would be wonderful. And do, do let uh, brother Andy here know, he'll probably get his address there or even let me know. And I would love to know, but it doesn't make it. I'm not doing that to, to gain any numbers. Thank you, Malcolm, for sharing that message with us today. And like Malcolm said, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your savior, and if you are saved, please let us know. If you have questions, use the comment section below. And if you have friends and family members who are saved and would like to share their testimony, contact me and we can record your testimony to share it with the world. Thanks again for watching. Have a wonderful day. Bye.